Welcome to the We Rise podcast, where we are building collective resilience. I'm your host, Christine Govet, business owner, wife, mother of two, paddleboarder, and I love working with communities across the nation. Join me as I share stories and strategies to inspire action to build resilience and community transformation. From the Navajo Nation to the mountains of Appalachia, incredible work is being done by community members and leaders. I'm excited to share more on the podcast today. Welcome. Greetings. Welcome to the We Rise podcast. I'm so glad you're here. Today's episode explores resilience in the Chesapeake Bay with a focus on St. Michael's, Maryland. We'll take a look at a high-level view of the gorgeous Chesapeake Bay, focusing specifically on the health of the bay. And we'll hear about how St. Michael's, Maryland has created economic and coastal resilience in recent decades. And for those that might be curious, the reference links for this episode are available in the show notes at the episode webpage at yesweerise.org. Enjoy. My family and I have spent quite a bit of time in and around the Chesapeake Bay, taking our 54-year-old sailboat, Josephine, out to explore the tidal rivers, creeks, and crisscrossing the bay. We've come to deeply love the bay and the people, plants, and animals that inhabit its waters. Seeing people fish, swim, pray, boat, and just being by the water. Ospreys, heron, and bald eagles frequently fly overhead, and cord grass, oaks, pine, and marshmallow line the edges of the bay and its tributaries. The Chesapeake Bay is one of my favorite places on the planet. The original people that lived along the bay included many tribes, the Powhatan tribe in Virginia, the Susquehannock people of Pennsylvania, and the Anacostians around what is now known as Washington, D.C., and many more Native nations. There's a deep history, culture, strength, and connection to the lands and waters of the Bay region. As has happened with many Native people, after European settlers, their populations fell drastically. Many people were killed, others died of disease, and those who were left were forced off their ancestral homeland and relocated. However, today, tens of thousands of people who identify as Native American live in the Chesapeake region. To look more broadly, the Chesapeake Bay covers roughly 64,000 square miles with 50 major rivers and streams and with 18 million people and over 3,600 plants and animals inhabiting the watershed. The Chesapeake Bay is the largest estuary in the United States and the third largest in the world. At the same time, its waters are also uniquely imperiled, and many places in the bay are extremely vulnerable to sea level rise. Many people are also working on solutions, working with nature, which we'll hear more about in this episode. Water quality challenges in the bay include nitrogen and phosphorus nutrient loading, a large dead zone, which is an area with little to no oxygen in the water, sediment runoff, and a lack of water clarity. However, there are a number of organizations and agencies working together to improve water quality in the Bay through partnerships to implement a pollution diet or what is known as a total maximum daily load in the Bay. Many farmers, agency staff members, and nonprofit organizations are all working together to implement practices that help improve water quality. These include planting trees and vegetation and streamside buffers, enhancing ecosystems, and restoring living shorelines or marshes along the water's edge and decreasing sediment runoff. Many of these practices go hand in hand with recreation, as well as fishing and oystering. According to the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, if fully implemented by 2025, the Chesapeake Clean Water Blueprint will make sure that pollution reductions in the Chesapeake Bay will lead to fishable, swimmable waters as promised by the Clean Water Act of 1972. And again, that would be in just a few years from now. A peer-reviewed economic report estimated the economic value of implementing the practices that will result in a restored Chesapeake Bay will produce natural benefits of more than $22 billion annually. Simultaneously, there are numerous challenges, including the influence of climate change, which scientists expect will intensify storms and wash more pollutants into the waterways, which also must be addressed. Much of the Chesapeake Bay shoreline is still a working waterfront, with activity and infrastructure in place to support the oystering, fishing, and crabbing, and other livelihoods that have been in place for hundreds of years. Before the advent of the railroad in 1884, almost all commerce in the bay took place by water, as there are few roads on the interior. Most large farms, both on the bay side and the seaside, had their own docks for shipping goods out to market, as well as offloading seafood. Historically, 
Tons of oysters were hand-tonged, patent-tonged, or dredged. By the turn of the 20th century, 10 million bushels of oysters were harvested and sent to market. In addition, commercial fish landings were huge until the 1950s. But there have been numerous challenges to fishing in the bay. Commercial fishing continues today, but a much smaller scale. Blue crabs, which are extremely perishable, were packed in ice and shipped via steamer to Baltimore and Washington. Many regions in the bay have fished and oystered as their primary economic routes, including in St. Michael's, Maryland, which is a fascinating example of a transitioning bay economy and a place my husband Reed and I visited in early summer of 2021. Located on Maryland's eastern shore of the Delmarva Peninsula, the town of St. Michael's is a beautiful Chesapeake Bay coastal town. With only about a thousand full-time residents, it's a small, close-knit community. Today, it contains several historic sites and continues the historic trade of fishing for oysters, crabs, and fish. It's home to the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum, housing collections of Chesapeake Bay artifacts, visual arts, and indigenous watercraft. The town has several marinas docking hundreds of boats in the summer and an 1879 lighthouse that visitors can walk through. Its picturesque harbor and the preserved maritime history has made the town popular for both tourists and locals. St. Michael's is located about halfway between the Susquehanna River headwaters and the Atlantic mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. Situated on an inlet from the Chesapeake Bay formed by the Miles River, the town's harbor dates back to the 1600s. The region was home to the Chop Tank people who fished, hunted, and farmed. In 1669, the Chop Tank Indian Reservation was established, but the state of Maryland sold off the land in 1822. In the 1600s, the region served as a trading post for tobacco farmers and trappers. The town's industry evolved into shipbuilding, and it was the target of a British military attack during the War of 1812, at which point the town earned its name as the town that fooled the British. Several historic buildings dating back several centuries are still standing in town. Later in the 19th century, the town became revived by an oyster industry with most households engaged in fishing in the water or working in the shucking houses that came to line the waterfront. At just 10 feet above sea level, the waterfront's town location on the eastern shore places it in one of the most vulnerable regions in the country to sea level rise. The eastern shore is projected to receive a higher than average sea level rise and is threatened by frequent flooding. 86 acres in the town of St. Michael's are currently below an elevation of 5 feet, putting many areas at risk for rising sea level and surges in the near future. At the same time, many towns along the Chesapeake Bay are experiencing shifting landscapes due to sea level rise with some islands and coasts disappearing entirely in recent decades. Building collective resilience looks different in different places. Resilience means growing a stronger, brighter future for generations to come. It also takes many shapes and comes in different sizes. Resilience includes building community, a healthier environment, and robust local economies. It also means growing equity, inclusion, and belonging, care of self and others, and creating regeneration at all levels. What stories and strategies inspire you? Share your ideas with us on social media and check out our website at yesweRise.org to find the show notes, interview videos, and the links mentioned on the podcast today. Low-lying land prevails in the town, and the water's edge has been protected mainly by hard edge or bulkhead shorelines. This is a type of infrastructure that's been commonly used in the past, with less frequency now, though, as living shorelines are more commonly being used to help communities adapt to sea level rise and flooding. With awareness of the town's precarious location, the town established a Climate Change and Sea Level Rise Commission to improve the town's resiliency measures. The town received a grant through the State of Maryland's Community Resilience Program in 2019. The grant was used to conduct an analysis of the St. Michael's Harbor and stormwater infrastructure while considering projected sea level rise over the next 30 years. The report notes that the goal of the study is to develop the topography of tidal flooding areas around the harbor as the sea level rises in the next 30 years, and together with stormwater infrastructure assessment and projected impacts, to complete a detailed analysis to develop viable, cost-efficient strategies and projects to prepare for sea level rise over the next 35 years. The study should be considered the first phase in a multi-year initiative by the town of St. Michael's to prepare for the consequences of sea level rise. As part of the study, the town coordinated community outreach efforts to gather input from community members of St. Michael's. The town used a map-based crowdsourced survey, the St. Michael's Citizen Flood Reporter, an app which citizen users were prompted to add in a point on the map correlated to their own property or a general flooding problem spot. Citizens were able to share their own experiences and how they were affected by flooding. 
The report outlines the next steps the town might take to prepare for and put plans in place to begin future mitigation and adaptation efforts. The town has transitioned in the last 50 years from a primarily fishing community to having a significant tourism economic base. The coastal industry and the maritime atmosphere attracts many tourists to this small town. St. Michael's now has crab houses along the water and unique restaurants and shops lining the main street, located in historic buildings with some directly on the water. St. Michael's also embraces its natural surroundings and setting for many outdoor activities, and it's known as a prime boating destination in Chesapeake Bay. The town is the home base for many biking routes, as well as kayaking, sailing, and paddleboarding. The Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum is a fascinating example of both honoring the history of St. Michael's, supporting the tourism base in the town, and offering educational opportunities through its 18 acres in the center of town along the water's edge. The Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum has 12 buildings, including a boatyard where wooden ships are still built and craftspeople are trained to keep the tradition alive. The museum also has active docks, which welcomes boats from across the Atlantic and the bay. The Maritime Museum is also the site of a living shoreline or natural marsh, which in this case is a protective stone sill with sand filled in behind it, planted with native wetland plants, preventing erosion and creating a place where plants and animals can thrive. Living shorelines are a proven natural approach to protecting tidal shorelines from erosion and in Virginia are actually required unless a site is shown to not be suitable for their use. When compared to shorelines lined with riprap, bulkheads, and concrete, living shorelines have many benefits, including providing cleaner water through filtering pollutants and settling sediment. They're beautiful and they create habitat for birds, blue crabs, fish, and nesting turtles. Native bay grasses, Plants, shrubs, and trees are often planted with a protective structure such as a casing made of oyster shells or coconut fiber rolls to protect vegetation and soils, and oysters are often included as well. In Virginia, our firm, Dialogue and Design, facilitates a collective called the Living Shoreline Collaborative, and you can learn more about it at the James River Shoreline at the website jamesrivershorelines.org. Back in Maryland, though, St. Michael's will continue to change as seas rise and industries shift, and the town is exploring additional economic options to help facilitate this transition that are fueled by heritage and nature-based tourism opportunities, including exploring enhancing remote work options, medical facilities, and home-based industries. As the tourism industry continues to grow in St. Michael's, the town's focus has remained on the natural assets that have driven its past industries as well. Surrounded by water, many activities and economic strengths center around the beautiful harbor that St. Michael's offers. St. Michael's provides an example of how many other Bay communities could consider transitioning their economies and prepare for sea level rise through engaging community members, supporting the community's history, and also proactively planning for a changing future. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of the We Rise podcast. We want to give a special shout out and thanks to Leah Taylor of Dialogue and Design for her research and work on this episode. Thank you for joining the We Rise podcast. To learn more about the stories and speakers featured in this episode, check out our website at yesweRise.org. You'll find the show notes, interview videos, the links mentioned today, and you can join our email list. Subscribe to the show to catch every new episode and leave us a review or a rating. You can also find us on Facebook or Instagram at Collective Resilience We Rise to share your ideas. The Collective Resilience We Rise podcast is produced by Dialogue and Design Associates, podcasting for creatives with music by Drishti Beats. Thanks so much for listening.